Family Values Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is the conclusion. In a remarkable essay published in 1960, Why I Am Not a Conservative, Frederick Hayek offers a sustained reflection on the complex historical relationship between classical liberalism and the modern conservative tradition. Here he takes issue with the charge of conservatism that is commonly leveled against the modern inheritors of classical economic liberalism. If conservatism or if conservatives and neoliberals are united in their aversion to socialism, he concedes, their orientations are nevertheless radically divergent, since only conservatism is exclusively defined by its desire to arrest change. Economic liberalism, by contrast, has never been a backward-looking doctrine. By its nature, it is oriented to the new. There never has been a time when liberal ideals were fully realized and when liberalism did not look forward to further improvement of institutions. This future orientation can be described as speculative in the sense that it appeals to no prior distribution of historical probabilities, and thus makes no claims to prediction. If one of the fundamental traits of the conservative attitude is a fear of change, a timid distrust of the new as such, the liberal position is based on courage and confidence, on a preparedness to let change run its course, even if we cannot predict where it will lead. So ingrained is this orientation toward the new, Hayek insists that neoliberals are prepared to entrust the future to uncontrolled social forces even when these forces emanate from a direction they do not like. Without preferring the new merely because it is new, the liberal is aware that it is of the essence of human achievement that it produces something new, and he is prepared to come to terms with new knowledge, whether he likes its immediate effects or not. Hayek's political philosophy of neoliberalism could usefully be described as preemptive, in the sense that its first instinct is to accommodate the future, whether in the form of new knowledge or new social realities. Yet Hayek is equally clear that the neoliberal will that the neoliberal will to adapt exists side by side with an unwavering def deference to historical selection. The social conventions of religion, family, and inherited wealth that are thrown up as if by chance by subsequently validated by the site but subsequently validated by the weight of social norms. If neoliberalism is prepared to accommodate the new of, con of uncontrolled social forces, then it is only in order to channel them into the constantly reinvented form of private wealth and familial inheritance. Thus, Hayek combines a speculative orientation toward the future with an unshakable respect for the, tra for the traditions that are period periodically validated or, in his words, selected in the process of spontaneous social evolution. His entire philosophy, in fact, could be read as an uncritical expression of the capitalist double movement, poised between the self-revolutionizing orientation of credit-based temporality and the imperative of sustaining tradition via the private distribution of wealth. This preemptive orientation is less often associated with neoconservatism, but Irving Kristol was clear on this point. If there was something that distinguished the neoconservatives from the American paleoconservatives or traditionalists, it was their willingness to accommodate and respond to change. What is neo new about this conservatism is that it is resolutely free of nostalgia. It too claims the future, and it is this claim, more than anything else, that drives its critics on the left into something approaching a frenzy of denunciation. Where paleoconservatives and traditionalists held steadfast in their opposition to the New Deal and its aftermath, neoconservatives were willing to confront and to some degree incorporate the changes wrought by the democratic movements of the post-war era. As children of the same democratic expansion, most of them were the sons or daughters of Jewish migrants. Neoconservatives remained committed to the New Deal welfare state, the civil rights movement, and even some of the interventions carried out under Johnson's Great Society. If they balked at the anti-normative liberation movements of the New Left and its derivatives, 
They also sought to neutralize their demands throughout the reorientation rather than the outright dismissal of the New Deal welfare state. In contrast to traditionalist conservatism then, both neoliberalism and neoconservatism can be defined by their preemptive orientation toward the political future. Brought together by their confrontation with the liberation movements of the 1960s, neoliberals and neoconservatives sought to contain the anti-normative and redistributive promise of these movements by capturing them within the horizon of reinvented tradition. Looking backward, they sought to revive an older, poor law tradition of private family responsibility. Looking forward, they sought to reinvent this, this tradition using the administrative legacy of the welfare state itself and to democratize its reach by the targeted expansion of consumer credit markets. In a somewhat paradoxical fashion, private family responsibility would become the guiding principle of social policy, and its boundaries would be stretched to include the non-normative subjects who were once radically excluded from the Fortis family wage. The neoconservative Nathan Glazer wrote that the creation and building of new traditions or new versions of old traditions must be taken more seriously as a requirement of social policy itself. The tradition he had in mind was one that had already undergone multiple reinventions throughout American history. At various moments, the colonial poor law tradition of family responsibility was adapted to deal with the emancipation of slaves, rising divorce rates, family dissolution among the white urban poor, and unmarried mothers seeking welfare. The neoconservatives and their fellow travelers sought to revive the poor law tradition once again by adapting it to what they saw as the excesses of the late Fordist welfare state. Unlike paleoconservatives and traditionalist conservatives, they were willing to work with the institutional legacy of the post-war welfare state to achieve this goal, seeking not to destroy the welfare state as such, but to repurpose it as the enforcer of traditional family values. In economic and social policy, noted Irving Kristol, neoconservatism feels no lingering hostility to the welfare state, nor does it accept it resignedly as a necessary evil. Instead, it seeks not to dismantle the welfare state in the name of free market economics, but rather to reshape it so as to attach it to the conservative predispositions of the people. Neoliberalism, for its part, can be defined as neo in the simple sense that it comes after the 20th century welfare state and is therefore confronted with the task of either overcoming its structures or adapting them to new ends. While individual neoliberal scholars have repeatedly called for the extreme reduction of the welfare state or the privatization of its most generous social insurance programs, social security, for instance, in practice their policy reforms have tended to repurpose rather than dismantle the institutional legacy of the 20th century welfare state. Most striking here is the way in which neoliberal social reformers have adopted the institutional innovations of Johnson's Great Society, which sought to decentralize, devolve, and outsource social service provision while simultaneously reinforcing federal authority over the general direction of welfare programs. The salient difference is that where Johnson-era federalization was designed to impose more more progressive rules on the states with the aim of expunging the last vestiges of the poor law tradition from state welfare practice, neoliberal welfare legislation has done the exact opposite. In fact, it has federalized the poor law tradition of public relief for the first time in American history and now imposes it on the states as the only viable model of welfare provision. At the same time, the micro-political implementation of these laws has been relayed downward and delegated to a multiplicity of private, non-profit, and faith-based actors now charged with the task of enforcing personal and family responsibility in the service of the state. Neoliberals and neoconservatives are able to resolve their differences through the mobilization of these so-called mediating structures, non-state organizations that perform the work of de facto privatization while also enforcing the moral virtues prescribed by federal welfare law. Unlike neoconservatives, however, neoliberal scholars recognize that if the poor law tradition were to be reactivated in any sustainable way, it would need to defer to and incorporate 
the anti-normativity of the late Fordist liberation movements. The imperative of private family responsibility could not be successfully revived unless it was somehow reconciled with the cultural and social revolution of the 1960s. Very early on, Milton Friedman and Gary Becker intuitively understood that such a project could be achieved via an enormous expansion of consumer credit, although the details of this policy solution would be worked out only in practice in the tumultuous economic cauldron of the following decades. After the Volcker shock of 1979, Democratic and Republican administrations from Reagan to Clinton discovered that the lingering claims of the late Fordist social revolution could be effectively neutralized by democratizing consumer credit and stimulating asset inflation. If the wage and welfare inflation of the 1970s had appeared to detach people from the private family and to encourage the proliferation of non-normative lifestyles, asset appreciation with its ties to private home ownership was understood as a means of disciplining these demands within the logic of inheritance. And if the late Fordist revolution in family life could not be simply reversed, it would be domesticated and made profitable by translating the non-normative lifestyle choice into the idiom of democratized credit. The curious temporal logic of credit, its ability to materialize the future and the present, was here harnessed as a means of recapturing non-normative desire in the inherently regressive form of private familial debt.